Welcome to Operation Solid Lives. This is level one, and we're in the last part of our lessons. And specifically, we're going to look at what this love that we've been talking about, that God has had for us, that Jesus has had for us, how it was acted out. Now, we mentioned, and I think we did a good job explaining from scriptures, especially in the New Testament, how God has made a way for you and I to have relationship with him through Jesus, but that wasn't something that was done um, only in legal terms. Um, and there is legal terms involved. There's a covenant involved. But this is about him wanting to be with us. And so we saw this beautiful picture of Jesus Christ portraying himself as the groom and that you and I, the church, are his bride. And the illustration, the parable that he told about selling all he had to get that pearl of great price, to get that treasure in the field. Well, this picture continues on with what we need to look at now. That this love in action, in fact, I want you to turn to Matthew 26 so we can start seeing how this love was acted out. Would you go with me to verse 36? Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go over and pray. Now, let's pause because there's an interesting word study on just the word Gethsemane. It's in the Greek, it means olive press or place of pressure. Now, you know the story of what happens in this garden. And, and this is the, the night that he's going to be betrayed. And he's going to be turned over to the, the soldiers. And yet he comes to a garden there with his, with his uh, disciples, asks them to, to sit. And he's going into this place of pressure. But it's also a place of fruit and fruitfulness where things are produced. In fact, the word garden... I didn't know this until we were preparing for this lesson a few months ago, that the word garden has to do with guarding the, the produce, guarding the valuable things. Why? Because life is contained in those things. We have to feed ourselves. All right. Well, this goes on in verse 37 to tell us that he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. In other words, he's, here's what he's saying. Hey, I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm, I, something's happening here. And he's talking to his closest friends here. That's what his disciples are, the, the, most, the, the close, uh, closest friends that he had. And he's asking them to stay with him in a time of great, great desperation. And he's preparing to take on the sins of the earth, the whole world, not only at present, but all past and all future. And he's having that now come upon him. It's unimaginable, the torture that he's feeling. In fact, Luke tells us over in his record of this, Luke 22, I think it's like about verse 44, it says that he sweat droplets of blood. Um, I've heard this explained that this can happen, that this isn't just a, some kind of metaphoric thing, that this can actually happen under great stress. People can begin to have blood come through the, the pores of their skin. Let, let, let's go on now and, and read further in verse 39. Stay here and watch with me, he said. And uh, he knew that they were coming, but he didn't know exactly when the guards were coming after him. And he went on a little further, we're told, and fell on his face. And prayed, saying, Oh, my father, listen to the desperation. Oh, my father. Remember, this is the father's delight talking to him. My father, help me. What, what am I going to do here? He says, If it's possible, let, can this, can, is there another way? Can this cup pass from me? He's in anguish. And yet, he, he turns to the only one who could possibly find another way is there is there any way this cup can pass and listen to his next words though 
Uh, here's, here's love in action. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40 tells us that when he came to his disciples, he found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? <laughs> it's just like in the garden. Just asking one simple thing. Don't, don't eat. Now he's just asking the disciples one simple thing. Could you just pray? Could you just keep an eye on things and pray with me? And, 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 and he, they couldn't do that. They failed. Oh, brother. I think of times that I've, I've promised God that I would do more praying or I would do more reading in the Word or I would do more for Him and I end up falling asleep. Maybe not even physically, although I think sometimes I physically have fallen asleep when I promise I'd get up early and pray. Uh, but I've fallen asleep spiritually. Yeah. Thank God, nevertheless, he said, not as I will, but as you will, Father. And boy, he remained faithful to that promise. Well, he tells him again, look at verse 41. He says, watch and pray, lest you enter into, into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing. Amen. It's willing, but that flesh, he says, is weak. Again, a second time he went in and prayed, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and he found him asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to paint too much of a picture of that being you because it's got my face all over it. I'm thinking of times just where my eyes got heavy, uh, you know, making big promises. Lord, I'll never fail you like Peter later does. And within a nanosecond, I'm failing him. Man. 44 says he left him again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. He, he's alone. He, he, he doesn't look, look at, it appears that these guys don't understand it. They're, they don't know what, what's going on. They don't get it. His closest friends in the world don't understand what he's facing. There's a picture of you. There's things you're facing. Maybe right now as you're hearing my voice that are, you, you go, why doesn't anybody see this? Doesn't anybody feel this? What in the world? And, and people sometimes can be so obtuse. They can be so not on purpose, but they can be so just hard and insensitive to things you're going through. And you wonder, what kind of friends are these? Well, let me tell you, men will fail in this regard. But I want you to know, Jesus will never fail you. He knows exactly what you're going through. And let me tell you what he, he can do. He can not only identify, he'll help you get through it. Amen? Now, continue in Matthew 26. Let's go to Matthew 26. Uh, ongoing and uh, we're already there excuse me but let's get to verse 57 and those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas so he's been arrested now he's being brought into before the high priest Caiaphas and the scribes and elders were assembled there we're told and old Peter uh, followed him at a distance to the high priest courtyard and went in and sat with the servants to see the end now the chief priests, the elders, and the council, uh, this isn't the Roman council, this is just the, these are just the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. Um, they sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, we're told in verse 63. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Oh, what a hypocrite. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to them, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and the coming of the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you've heard this bla his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat 
in his face. All right, I want to pause here for a moment. Um, because we can, I know some of the portrayals. For instance, the the movie, the the Passion of the Christ. There's there's a very gruesome portrayal of what he went through. But I don't think we we even in that movie have any idea. Can you imagine? that it says they spat on his face. Do you think these were just like little, like, you know, little sprays? I'm going to tell you, these are the most disgusting things. And it, would, it wouldn't have been a little. It would have been all of them spitting on him. So now he's covered in spit. And we're told there that they beat him. Look at verse 67. And others struck him with pal the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Not just punch it doesn't say just punch but the, 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 he's being slapped he's being kicked he's being punched these are uh, hateful and, and you can imagine the demons that were just uh, assaulting these people as they uh, put this affliction on on the lord and as they they were spitting and kicking him and then we're told in verse 27 uh, excuse me chapter 27 verse 1 when morning came all right, this is why I want to pause. They've been spitting on him. They've been kicking him. They've been hitting him all night. All night. These Jewish religious leaders. Until morning. And it says, When the morning came, the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, Jesus stood before the governor. Look at verse 11. And we're told that the governor asked him, saying, are, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, it is as you say. Well, while he was being accused of, by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing, we're told in verse 12. And Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? He answered him not a word. He, didn't, he decided he didn't need to say anything. So that the governor marveled greatly. Now let's continue on in verse 15. It says that the, at, now at the feast of the governor, uh, there was a custom where, of releasing to the multitude one of the prisoners whom they wished. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release to you? Do you want to have Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that he had handed over uh, this man. He, Jesus had been handed over because of envy. In other words, Pilate was, there's something going on here. He's figuring this out. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife, Pilate's wife came to him. And he said, have nothing to do with this just man for i have suffered many things today in a dream because of him now this is kind of mysterious but somehow she was aware of what was going on and she's saying look don't have don't do anything and, and i, I want to tell you what i think this is i think god was telling Pilate, you have no idea who you're dealing with you have no idea the power that this man represents that sits before you that you are looking at wondering why he doesn't talk he doesn't need to talk to you and may i just say that you know where god's heart is god's heart is just thinking about how he's getting his delight back not trying to make a defense for himself you know that's a good thing for me to pause and just say some of the best soul winning is going to happen not because you make a good defense for the gospel but that you talk about how God wants his delight back and look a person in the eyes and say, and that's you. <laughs> I love that. Let's, let's go on. Verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Well, Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Christ or Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. Now look at verse 26. And they released Barabbas to them. And when they had scourged Jesus, when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered, Pilate delivered him to be crucified. Now, 
this is not just little drops of blood, you know, sweat coming from his pores like now. Now now he's being scourged. Okay, he's been kicked, beaten, punched, spit upon all night. Stood before the people who he came for. Remember, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. And now he's standing there in this false trial with all these lies being told. And we're just told this in, in Matthew with these few words. And he had Jesus scourged. He had him scourged. Now, you know, probably some of you have studied this. That's that cat of nine tails where it was essentially a whip with, the, with nine braided uh, leather uh, straps on it that in the braids were put shards of glass, pieces of metal, and sharp pieces of bone. And by the way, this was not something that was when it was used once and covered in blood that it was cleaned up. This was probably covered with all sorts of prior uh, uses, not including only blood. And you, I'll let your imagination go. And now this is happening to Jesus. This is happening to him. He's being whipped. And yet, it's all part of the plan. Remember Isaiah? He said, by his stripes, we are healed. And Peter picks up on it. And Peter says, by his stripes, we were healed. And I'm thankful, even though as hard as it is for me to read this and think about him going through that, that he didn't just die, but he died this painful death, this horrible death, that he prophesied and promised that by this, through this, there would not only be salvation, but healing as a result. Oh, thank the Lord. Amen? Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put that on his head and mocked him. They put a reed, it's, we're told, in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spat on him. And they took the reed and struck him on the head. And this is, by the way, when you hear the word reed, I don't want you to think about some little weed growing. This is a stick. It would be equivalent to a broomstick or or, or maybe even something more stout. And they're beating him with it. And it says that they struck him on the head. And, and when they had mocked him, they took a robe off him and put his clothes on and led him away to be crucified. And can I, can I just say, here he is, he's been stripped naked. I mean, it's one thing to have the humiliation of a false trial, the pain of having people beat you, the, the gross... Ugh, how gross would it be to have people just spit right in your face? Now, he's being humiliated at a, at a whole new level. He's stripped naked. And this, this being stripped naked uh, is the man, remember? Um, it was a master craftsman. He made the, the seahorse, Remember? Remember the little sea otter we talked about? He's being beaten by the very ones he came to save, by the very ones that were made in his image. The one that knew that I would like giraffes. I just think they're the coolest animal. That's the one who's facing this, okay? So, now we read in verse 37 that they put on his head the accusation of written against him. They put it over his head. And this is the accusation. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, I got ahead of myself a little bit because I want to come back to verse 35. It's only four words that I want you to look at. There's four words. Then they crucified him. Then they crucified him. I think you've got ideas. We all have pictures of what that is like, no, we don't. I mean, we can have people explain. I've had, I've, I've read doctors' explanations on how you die when you're crucified, and uh, how the Romans would, they, they, they were geniuses at this. They could take the pain and extrapolate it for a long period of time to make it the most miserable, the most horrible, the most awful death. 
they're in front of everybody too. Everyone's free to come and look at you that's hanging on this cross. And it's just recorded with those four words, then they crucified him. And I want to have you know that they put that sign over his head, Jesus, the King of the Jews. Yeah, he is the King of the Jews. He's also the King of the Gentiles. He's also wisdom, whose delight is in the sons of men. Well, we're told there's two robbers by him, verse 38. And we're told that they were crucified with him, and there was one on the right, one on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, You who destroy the temple and will build it in three days, save yourself. You're the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Just mocking him. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking with the scribes and the elders, said he saved others. He, he himself cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the two robbers, look at verse 44. Even the two robbers were, that were crucified with him reviled him. Now, I know we'd like to talk about the one thief who, is not, who said, will you remember me? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But before that guy came to that point, he was just like all those other people reviling him. May I just say that's a lot like you and I. Oh, I'm glad that I've asked him, could I, could I have a relationship with you? And he said, one day we're going to be in paradise together, Joel. Well, you, you got it. And yet I can remember times when I've reviled him. How about you? Well, we're told there that verse 45, that about the sixth hour, that, um, until the ninth hour, there was darkness, which is an amazing thing. Here, here the one that created the heavens and the earth, the one who created this, this sun, this great light during the day, all of a sudden that light has come and ceased. And then it says that in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All right. Remember the master craftsman, wisdom, who is the delight of the father, now can't even get the father to answer him. And why is that? Because he's taken upon himself what you and I deserve. We deserve to have that rejection, to have that punishment, to have that kind of humiliation. Those are all things we deserve. He took that on himself. But more than just taking the sin, he took the guilt of sin. He took the rejection that comes from God as a result of sin. And he was not only suffering, he was paying a penalty, a penalty. Now. Look at verse 50. It says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, here's what I want to do. We're going to, we're going to finish with this. Why don't you go over to Hebrews 12 with me? Let's just finish with this. Let the Lord minister to us for a moment here, okay? Hebrews 12 and find verse 1, all right? Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You know, this is coming right after chapter 11, which is called the Hall of Faith. You know, there's all these great figures of faith, beginning with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Well, there's other people in that great cloud of witnesses. One of them is my dad. I've got some others up there that I love a lot and this. They're up there rooting us on. It says, since we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin, the sin, that so easily ensnares us. And let us run this race with endurance that's been set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, when I've heard this, these verses, and I've even taught this to some degree in this way, of course there's shame in the cross. Being convicted 
being being killed like a common criminal when you're innocent, having everyone humiliate you the way he was humiliated. Of course, there's shame with that. But but can I bring it to a different maybe context? That's our groom, the groom that um, says you and I are his treasure, and now he's hanging, unclothed, beaten, in front of everybody. When I knelt down and proposed to my wife Kathy before she was my wife, I I, I thought very intentionally about what I was going to wear. I wanted to look good. I had my hair combed. I think I got it even cut that day. I was shaved, showered, clean. I think I even had cologne on that smelled pretty good. I wanted to look my best. This groom is looking his worst. Who for the shame? The shame. He endured that cross. Why? Because there was something of joy set before him. Now, what do you figure that is? I've heard people say, well, that was the, the hope of getting back to heaven to be with his father. Certainly, that's included. But you want to know what the joy was? You. Remember? You're his delight. Who for the delight that was set before him? He looked beyond the cross and he saw, ah, yeah, we'll be together forever. This is settling it right now. This is taking care of it. This is that deadly blow to Satan, to all of his cohorts, and to the sin that we have been made guilty by. It's now being taken care of through this. He's our groom. We are married to him. He's given his life for his bride. He's laid it down. And as many as receive him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. I pray you never forget that. 